Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Maris Kreisman, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for your questions, so start thinking about them now. You can put your Zoom que your questions in the Zoom chat at any time and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. We're glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Throughout the evening, I'll post links in the chat to buy a copy of Aviary from McNally Jackson. Uh, Jen Dahl in the New York Times book review writes, even when it hurts, and if you have anything in the way of feelings, this novel will make you weep. Aviary is a cleansing antidote to the last few years of political and cultural turmoil, a solve to combat our still raging health crisis, a tonic for our social media spin out. This quietly important book offers hope as it tackles grief and isolation and our essential humanity. And I'm so delighted to introduce to you tonight, Deirdre McNamer. She is the author of four previous novels, Rhyme in the Woods, One Sweet Quarrel, My Russian, and Red Rover, which was a winner of the Montana Book Award and was named a Best Book of the Year by Art Forum, The Washington Post, and The LA Times. She's taught writing at Cornell, Williams College, the University of Ohio, the University of Oregon, the University of Alabama, the University of Montana, and the Bennington Writing Seminars, where she currently holds a faculty position in the Low Res MFA program, and she lives in Missoula, Montana. And tonight she is joined by Betsy Bonner, who's the author of The Book of Atlantis Black, a memoir published by Tin House, and of Round Lake, a poetry collection published by Four Way Books. She's a former director of the 92nd Street Y Underberg Poetry Center, where she now teaches creative writing. And I'm so, uh, so pleased to introduce you both, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Betsy. Thank you, Maris. It's wonderful to be at McNally Jackson with my friend Dee. I first met Deirdre McNamer, I call her Dee, five years ago in Missoula, Montana. We had friends in common in the writing program where she taught. I'd moved out there with my calico cat, Leah, and after the semester was over, I was living in a rural place. I had to catch the first flight of the day to travel back to New York. It would be three flights to get from Missoula to Albany with Leah, who was in her late teens and had three legs. Before the airport, I had to drop off the truck I'd borrowed from another friend and leave it at his place in town. I mentioned this problem at dinner with mutual friends. I didn't know Dee very well, but she seemed to know me immediately. Dee said she'd be there at 4.45 a.m to transport me and the calico. It was her idea. In Aviary, McNamer's fifth novel, we're back in Missoula with characters living in or involved with an imaginary condominium building that has a lot of retired people. It's called Pheasant Run, where there's a fire and an investigation. Arson opens the layers of mystery and characters interconnectedness but that first and most apparent of crimes only skims the surface of what's to come. Aviary is much bigger than the original fire. For example, one character gives another an alibi, not because he asked her to, but because she knows he would have been a major suspect in the crime. Some of what's understood and complicit between characters goes unmentioned between them, but the reader will come to know their motives and what happened. And I also, as Maris did, saw the New York Times book review this week. Uh, one thing I think Maris didn't say, it said that McNamer is a wordsmith of rare artistry, 
who can take your breath away with a sentence describing a fairly average habit of weather. She's funny too, combining flawless prose with cutting cultural commentary, as I'm sure you'll see. So we'll start with a reading, uh, a short reading from the very beginning of Aviary by Dee. Hi Dee. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, thank you, McNally, Maris. I see some names I know. Uh, Jolene, Cecily, PC. Hi. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, I'm just going to read briefly um, two pages, uh, but this is the opening. While they, is my sound okay? Okay. While they slept, the sun lifted itself above the mountains around to spread light on the little city below. Inside that city, urban deer glided across frozen November lawns to return to their hollows under backyard pines. Feline huntresses licked the blood off their paws and went home for kibbles and stomach rubs. A tied up shivering dog made three tight circles in the dirt and began to park, bark. Two joggers with lights on their shoes panted grimly and stepped up their pace. An old falcon moved slowly, ejecting rolled newspapers onto front steps. And then a roseate calm prevailed and the mountains moved in closer. While they slept in their boxes inside the bigger box of their four-story building, street sounds began, the buses, the early workers. The river moved with low water deliberation through the center of town, carrying oblong shards of ice beneath one bridge and then another. A muttering man with crazy hair dragged a lumpy sleeping bag from a stand of tall bushes and resettled himself beneath the second bridge up under the trusses, a few yards from the coffee place on the ground floor of the new bank. They slept not far from the river in a neighborhood thickly planted with maples and tall old homes in a 24 unit residence for seniors called Pheasant Run. In a normal autumn, the maples put on showy displays, fanning high into the sky then shattering into slow red waterfalls until the branches were lattices, not crowns, and the sky was twice as large. This year, the leaves have refused to drop. They have clung ash colored to the branches, inspiring general unease and several letters to the newspaper, which invited a certified arborist to weigh in. He explained that the normal separation process between leaf and twig produces a membrane that seals off the leaf and enables it to fall. Extreme cold at the wrong time, like the shocking sub-zero stretch of days that happened in October, can derail that process, he said, and the tree basically clutches and the leaves stay attached. They were strange, those gray leaves, abiding in the wrong place at the wrong time. They turned the trees to, to sepia-toned photographs, or remembered trees or witnesses to some sapless aftermath. They slept at Pheasant Run and then they woke and prepared to move into a day with nothing yet about it to suggest the small and large shocks to come. Faint predictable smells trickled into the hallways, oatmeal, burned toast. Some televisions were turned on for talk shows or weather, and a few were loud enough because of their owner's hearing difficulties that the adjacent tenants began another day feeling cranky and contemplating notes of complaint. The morning no noises tended not to include conversation as most of the residents lived alone or with an ailing late sleeping spouse. Okay, that's, that's the opening. <clears throat> Gee, that's stunning and thank you for reading it. So much of aviary has the quality of enchantment. Your novel opens like a fairy tale while they slept. Each of your first two paragraphs begin, begins with these words. The book is also a thriller. To me, it's this lyrical hybrid of thriller and fairy tale. 
And I wanted to ask, was aviary always conceived this way? I think that um, I try to, maybe in everything that I've, all the fiction I've written, I try to um, write for a poet's ear. You're a poet. I'm writing for your ear. Maybe because poets tend to use language in a conjuring sort of way. In my, this is my take anyway, to poets try to address the ineffable, the unsayable. And um, I want to try to do that as well. I do try to do it. But I also want to tell a story. And that generally involves um, a progression from one situation to another via the actions, choices um, of believable characters. That's what I'm trying for. And that requires propulsion and engine ten tension. Um, so in three books, I've two before Aviary, I've tried to do that by installing some kind of mystery um, as a propulsion device, actually. Um, so yes, I did in this, in this book, I, I originally conceived it as a mystery, um, a comic mystery with quirky, dark undertones is so I, kind of how I thought of it. And I'm not really that great at conventional mysteries. I mean, some people just are so, so quick and um, clever really about constructing a classical mystery. And, and I'm really not, um, but I try, I, I wanted to try. And, um, but what happened to me was as this mystery sort of unfolded, you know, who set a fire in this old people's apartment um, and why. Um, it's an arson investigation. Were they trying to scare the people out? You know, were there other nefarious motives? But I found myself getting, I worked on it so long that I found myself getting so involved with the characters that other mysteries, sort of bigger mysteries, started to take over and jostle with the conventional kind of mystery. And ultimately I kind of gave it up to the, to the bigger mysteries. I do solve the smaller mystery, but I found myself being more interested in mysteries that are less manageable. You know, the mystery of memory and it's sometimes fragile relationship to reality. Um, mystery, the mystery of yearning, the mystery of self-sacrifice, of cruelty for its own sake, the mystery of runaway greed, the mystery of joy, um, the mystery of being on, on the very last run of your life, um, which I think is really underestimated when we think about old, quite old people in their 80s, most of the people in this story are in their 80s who live in the building, are, um, you know, it's, it's a dramatic time of life. It's, it's um, you are reviewing, you are living with the consequences of decisions that you made perhaps decades earlier. Um, I just find it extremely dramatic um, in, a, in a quiet sort of way. So, it, so that's my long answer to your nice succinct question, which is yes, I did start it as a mystery, um, a kind of thriller. I wanted that fairy tale tone. Um, because I think there's also something about that time of life and maybe a, a town like Missoula on the edges of its day that is so, it has this kind of suspended feel to it. And um, I mean, I like to be awake for that. And um, I like to think about it. And, and there is a, a sort of different town in place on the very edges of the day in my experience. Oh, it's, it's a wonderful answer, Dee, and it's addressing the layers. I mean, as I said in that intro, it's just on the surface about this arson, this kind of crime that's, you know, on the book jacket and in the reviews, it's like there are other crimes and there are layers um, to these characters' lives. I wondered if you could tell us about your early influences. You mean reading influences? Yeah. How early? <laughs> oh, oh gosh. I mean, as early as you can remember. How did you get here? Well, I grew up in a in a 
very, very small, very windy, dusty little town way up in northern Montana with a whole bunch of brothers and sisters. And, you know, it was the cold cut bank. It was the coldest spot in the nation officially several times every winter, it seemed like. So it was. So what did I go read as a child? I grew up in a reading family. We had books all the time. We didn't have television until my parents, I thought were so cruel because they wouldn't buy us a television until John Kennedy was shot. And I was 12 then, yes, I was 12 then. And um, it, uh, it had to be something that big, you know? So we were all reading and of course, I gravitated toward English countrysides, you know, the secret garden, everything that wasn't cut bank. Um, you know, later on, Wuthering Heights, Jane Eyre, you know, just sort of gothic y, other century work. Um, I read piles of Nancy Drew's, um, just piles of them, and, um, and basically was a kind of promiscuous reader you know I just I read sort of everything like I mean I could just get lost in the medicine section of Time magazine when I was about eight years old you know I just I you know fearing I was going to get some horrible disease you know and tantalizing myself with that fear and that sort of thing and then later on um, I uh, you know sort of moved into oh some Salinger and um, oh, there was a real popular book called A Separate Piece when I was early in college. And, you know, these kind of thinky, neurotic, um, young adult sort of stories. Um, but when you, you know, I was thinking about about what happened after that, my reading and my serious reading that contributed most directly to my writing later on, I think, happened in about, um, well, in the mid 80s, I had worked for almost a decade then as a daily journalist. And um, I was working that summer in Helena, Montana for the Associated Press and um, to pay my way through the MFA program, basically, I was, and uh, by then I had quit the newspaper, but I had this summer job. And I remember there was a series of Fred Astaire, um, <laughs> so dance movies. And um, I lived in this crazy house that I was house sitting for somebody that had a penguin obsession. And so there were all these little penguins all around the house, like on the light switches on, you know, just penguins everywhere. So I felt a little unhinged anyway, being there. And then I was unhinged from the job, which was, you know, just real hard shift work and working hard and fast. It's like being an air traffic controller working for a wire service. And so I'd go home and just bury myself in these Fred Astaire movies. And um, I thought, I remember thinking at that time that I want to be able to write like Fred Astaire dances. Um, especially if Fred Astaire ever cried. He has that really icy top to him, you know, but just that elegant, um, fast, effortless looking um, movement um, that I thought was so beautiful um, that I thought, well, that's what I would like to write like. Later on, I felt the same thing when I saw Savian Glover dance live in New York. And, um, you know, I just, I was sitting two rows up and I could see the sweat flying off the dancers. And I, um, and I, I kept thinking, I, I want that fleetness. I want that, that boldness. And I want a certain, certain very, um, I don't know, put together surface, but with a lot of strange things happening down at the foot level, you know, and fast things. Um, so that was an influence. And I started to bring in other influences like that of dancers and, and music. And, um, and then I hit Alice Monroe, really. I would say she is my first, first real model as a, 
when I was getting into serious fiction writing, who was doing a, another kind of magic. Um, she had, you know, her prose, if, if you know it, has this very kind of not stolid, but but not hijinks. You know, the, the prose is stylistically very plain seeming. It's it's very Canadian in some ways. That's a mean thing. Not mean, but it's like it's a it's a, a rural Canadian kind of way of talking. And I'm familiar with with Canada because I live so close to it. And so it's like not a lot of showing off or or as I say, you know, stylistic hijinks. Um, but but she also is making these wild moves, you know. I mean, she she goes directions in her stories that you shouldn't be able to go in terms of of time, um, in terms of a kind of uncanny precision, um, which I noticed that same kind of, you know, Fred Astaire precision. Um, I remember a phrase once early on, um, I think this was Alice Munro, a character in one of her stories had a strategic smile and you know, that kind of just nailing it, um, I started to look for very closely in her work and in other people's work. And, um, but I'd have to say that she, she sort of launched my, my adult phase. That's fascinating. And I'm not, I'm not surprised uh, about that influence, Dee. How long did it take you to write Aviary? And how much did you know when you started? Well, it took me an immense amount of time to write eight years. I, my last book was published in 2007. So, and this is, I think, I hope I'm sending out this information as something heartening for writers, because what I did after that was work for three years on a novel that wasn't aviary. And, you know, it had some, some elements ultimately transferred, but finally it wasn't, catching it wasn't taking and I knew that and so I abandoned it and then um, I started spending quite a lot of time with my um, aging and declining in health parents in a, an apartment building here in Missoula that was for elderly people and um, and that that became a, a, a almost daily, um, contact for me, that place and, and the people there and my parents. And I just started writing little character sketches. They were not based on real people. The, the people in my book were only triggered really in some ways by, by people that I met in passing. Uh, and they aren't my parents really. Um, but um, I started just writing little sections during that time. And um, I could never, I was trying to make it, as I say, a funny mystery. And the situation with my parents was getting sadder and harder. And um, I think I was trying to just buffer myself in some ways from the situation by, you know, writing, making up a professor who's really a jerk and, um, you know, and making merciless fun of them on the page, you know, that sort of thing is kind of a cheap thing to do. But um, it was entertaining me and buffering me. And then finally, I moved beyond that and um, was into um, taking my characters that I had created seriously and not as just kind of devices to entertain me or, or satirize you know, certain realms of work or whatever. And so by that time, I, by the time I got into the serious writing of it, that, that was probably, well, yeah, I, I, I basically had it finished by um, about five or six years after I'd been working on it. And I know people just kind of shudder when they hear that, but I mean, that's been the case with all my novels. It, it takes, hmm, the only one that was within two years was the second one. And that's, you know, so it takes I, what it takes. I don't shudder at all. I, I am encouraged by hearing that kind of trajectory. And relatedly, so it's been 30 years since the publication of your first novel, Rima in the Weeds, which I also love. 
And while they're different books and set in different places in Montana, I found similarities in terms of having a cast of characters. Rima is also told from several different characters' points of view. And I wondered in your career as a novelist, is there anything that has remained the same for you in terms of your writing process or is each book a different animal? That's really such a good question. It's, it's hard to know, you know, um, I think probably other people can find strands that run, you know, that similarities between books, but in, in my mind, um, each one is a different animal. And, and the reason for that, I think, is that um, for me, I, I write to address something I've finally realized so to address something that haunts me in some ways. I'm haunted. I want to find out an answer to a question that nags at me. It doesn't have to be a big dramatic haunting, but um, over that amount of time, I have been haunted by different things. And so different kinds of books grow out of that. So for example, my first book was, was a kind of coming of age, you know, in some ways a conventional first novel in, in that respect. Um, a, the protagonist, one of them is a, about a 10 or 11 year old girl in a small town in Northern Montana. And, um, but what I was really, I think, writing off of was the story of the adult in that book who was a young woman who went off had a disastrous love affair comes back to town with a baby and um, the younger girl becomes the babysitter for this older woman who is really really barely holding it together and um, so it was a way to um, investigate um, what effect going home can have on um, someone who's been through a trauma in some ways. Um, it's, it was in a way to try to investigate how younger girls, at least in my experience, sometimes imprint on older ones who, you know, who seem to contain togetherness and glamor and um, some way to be. Um, and so it was those sorts of things. In the second book, I was basically haunted by my family, my, my grandparents' generation. And I see my cousin, Gerald Whetstone is tuning in. Um, it's our grandparents, our great grandparents um, who homesteaded in um, Northern Montana in the early part of the last century. And um, basically it was trying to investigate a combination of sort of naivete and bravery that I think characterized those people. And the naivete was reflected in a big drama that occurred in 1923 in the little town of Shelby in Northern Montana where the World Heavyweight Boxing Championship was fought because the town fathers there wanted the publicity and they got Jack Dempsey out there and they got a protagonist or you know a, a fighter professional um, second man kind of to fight him. And, um, and so in the end, that was me trying to figure, figure out a, a kind of pioneer personality that I alternately admired and that kind of infuriated me. Um, so, so those were very different books and it didn't help my publishing career that they were very different because the first one was, um, I mean, I got pressure really to kind of um, go on in the vein of the first book rather than go into this very stylistically different, very different book. Well, that's, I wanted to ask about your previous novel to Aviary. So Red Rover, it came from a true family story. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was your fourth novel. Um, and I wondered, about Pheasant Run specifically, though I think you've talked a bit, you've talked a bit about where Pheasant Run came from, whether there were real people in terms of your current book, Aviary, the new one. Um, 
are there characters based on real people in Aviary? Or would you? Well, I would say that um, the the character of Cassie McMacken, she's a kind of central character, has qualities of my mother, but it, it's not really a direct um, reflection of her at all. And the and the other characters are even further from from as I call them the triggering people. For instance, there was a a man in Missoula named um, Umberto Benedetti, and he was, he had been interned um, during World War II in the internment camp that existed on the edge of Missoula for Italians, Japanese, and some Germans, and made his whole life here. And he was an autodidact. He educated himself, he rode his bike around town, he never married. But I never spoke with him. I never, I didn't know him, but I used him. And this is sort of what I do as a trigger to ask myself, um, what if questions, you know, how, what did Umberto Benedetti feel when he first came to Missoula? What was it like to speak Italian in a sort of white bread, inner mountain college town, you know, and why didn't he go back? And, um, so I did a lot of research around about those, the Italians especially, and um, created another one in my book who looks different from Umberto and um, probably diff and differs in, in many respects from the actual man. And that's the kind of transfer that in my experience occurs. There we go. Sorry, I muted myself to make sure you were being <laughs> heard. Um, Dee, that's really interesting. And thank you for that answer. I want to jump to a question before the pandemic. You read at Bennington from what Bennington College, uh, what from what seems like a hugely interesting and complicated nonfiction project. Um, I'd love to hear you talk about that. There was an account of visiting a missile silo, and I connect that with two of your aviary characters calling Trump, our former president, Little Boy, which was the name of a Hiroshima bomb. So I want to ask, could you talk about growing up with the presence of nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear war? Um, yes. Uh... In about, when I was about 10 years old, we lived in another little town, um, not far from Cut Bank. Um, and in that year, that, that was um, 1960, um, an underground Minuteman nuclear missile system went in. And ultimately 200 tri-headed nuclear missiles were buried under the wheat, all in between and around these little towns um, on full alert. And so all it, so psychologically, we were nowhere in nobody's eye, <laughs> you know, and then the missiles were there and, and where I lived and everything for miles around was a major target if there had ever been, this was when it was, you know, the US and Russia only. And, um, you know, I wasn't taking all that in intellectually at the time, but there was a feeling of a kind of a shift and a sort of underground menace. There are still to this day, 150 of them underground on full alert. And um, which means that if they get a presidential order and two of the, mis the missile launch sites underground also um, communicate with each other and agree to send them off, they go. And uh, so I, uh, I've been fast, I've, that's my haunting. And that's probably one of my long hauntings is what does that all mean? What did it mean for me growing up uh, my sense of danger, my sense of um, what, you know, I think we're all trying to figure out what sort of precipices we might be walking, you know, consciously or inadvertently. And, um, and it now has combined with a, 
I've become much more knowledgeable. I, as, as you mentioned, I did go down into one of those nuclear missile site launch control centers. And it was a very eerie experience. And I would never be able to do it again because it was right before 9-11. And then the security just became something completely different after that. But um, now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to put some pieces together and they're way out on the edges right now. And I'm just trying to bring them in and see how they intersect. And the, the lines are nuclear missiles, nuclear, nuclear testing in the 50s that basically um, contaminated the milk, the, you know, the grasses of the area where I grew up. Um, and, you know, we took in as children a lot of radiation fallout. And um, so that, and, um, you know, it just, it has to do with my own, I've had health problems that are kind of strange. And um, I think about x-rays a lot. And, you know, it's all, um, it's all so nebulous now that it's not even very interesting to talk about, but when I write a piece of it at a time, I start to see how I might be able to move towards some other intersections down the road. So. I, I actually do find it interesting. <laughs> so to the contrary, and I know Maris came back because we wanted to, I guess, give everyone in this room the opportunity um, to ask you questions. But I thought just for a second, the very last thing do you agree that there's a political aspect to aviary? I mean, I just, the fact that it was published right now, yesterday was publication day. I mean, how could it help? How could it help but be political? Um, but is there anything you'd like to say about that or just open Well, it? I'll say one brief thing. Um, and it's not about the politics of it directly, but I wrote sections of this book several years ago that in which characters are saying something is on the move, something big is coming. At least two to three characters are going, trouble is at the door. And I finished the book um, before the pandemic and um, well before it and a year before probably. And then when I was doing my last, last tweaks to it, I changed the very end from just, you know, um, a kind of, it would have been too sentimental actually, the way I had it before, but I thought why not just call that last section February 20th, 2020. And when I did that, I don't allude really to what's coming any more than that, but I thought the thought that went through my mind was, and it sounds very woo woo, but the book knew more than I did about what was coming. The characters did. They were more, they, they saw something big at the door and I didn't. So anyway, and then just the politics of it, I think old people are, are a vulnerable class and um, the horror of how many in power are how, and how willing they are how many though, how willing those in power are to step on those who are vulnerable and on the edges is, um, is of course always political and moral and it's happening with old people. That's right. And Verges is another title of one of the parts in your mm -hmm. gorgeous book. Um, thank you, Dee. I'll hand it to Maris. Um, right now, we just have one question. So I'd like to encourage you, if you have any, uh, to just put them right in the chat. Um, and I have more. <laughs> if you have more, that's, that's perfect, too. Um, D. Cecily says, when you said that you sought to poetically describe the ineffable, ineffable, sorry, um, do you write poetry too? Or why have you chosen fiction instead or turned to fiction from nonfiction reporting? That's a good question, Cecily. Um, I knew Cecily in Missoula. She was a student in our program. Um, 
we have had some fabulous students. I don't write poetry, um, I think in part because, um, because I'm a little intimidated by it. I've never, I've never um, studied it, you know, formally. Um, I read it, it makes me want to write, you know, I love good, good, to hear good poetry, to listen to good poets. Um, but it may be more than that, that I want, I do want to tell a story. I do like that line of, um, you know, one set of circumstances unfolding into another set of circumstances. And so that there's this, um, and, and characters and, you know, humans changing over time. And I guess I just want to deal with that a little more directly. Um, but I do believe in what I know poets do, that the form, the way in which a, something is said actually affects and even determines the content. And that was a big thing for me to learn. Um, and I've uh, just, how you say something, the words you choose, the rhythms you choose, the, what you don't say um, has a very direct effect on the content of what you're trying to say. That's excellent. And I'm not seeing the next question yet. So I'm going to just ask, I'm going to say, D, you and I, and anyone who has one though, throw it in the chat if you feel like it. We've got maybe five minutes. Um, we both have a Catholic background, you and I. There's Cassie McMacken, whom you've mentioned in this talk, um, who has a kind of, she loses her faith, but she still prays. And I won't ask you to read the little section I was thinking of asking you since we're a little short on time, but I thought I'd ask the mystical plays a role in this book, the idea that a story could have its own volition. And this thing you're talking about with poetry, it's one of those, since uh, Cecily mentioned ineffable and so did you, it's, it's kind of like impossible to <laughs> phrase the question, but it has to do with putting the numinous and the comic, because this has been, this was mentioned in the Times Review, this is absolutely the case in all of your writing. There's a wit and there's humor that somehow is up against this numinous, divine, kind of supernatural, mysterious thing. And I, I think it's one of the reasons your writing isn't categorizable um, and that it's appealing to people who read a lot of different genres, but specifically the lyrical, and then the thriller, so the sort of numinous and the comic, it's not really a question, but is there, is, you know, is there something, is there a comic writer who influenced you? I don't think you mentioned those, though you said humor was important. And how conscious is that? It just, it sort of appears in your writing, though I'm sure it's something that you are conscious of after the fact. Yeah, I, um... I think he, he, there, there are different kinds of humor. And there's the humor that sort of verges more on satire and you know, which is a kind of humor from a position of power. You're, you're sort of um, actually making fun of, of your characters or you, you know, using them in some ways to point out the absurdities of you know, human interaction or whatever. The kind of humor that I like is more of a, of a kind of laugh while you cry <laughs> kind, you know, which is that I think, I think there's, um, for me, laughter and seeing, seeing the ridiculous in a situation has always been a great release in some ways. And I think we all know that we have, we all have a couple of friends probably that you can get together with and um, just laugh like you can't with anybody else. You think the same bizarre things are, you know, funny. And uh, so there's that, that sort of, and it's a real shared bond, I think. And it's, it's rare enough that um, we know it when we see it and feel it. And it's, and it's an important aspect, I think, of closeness between people. Um, but, you know, I don't, I haven't really modeled or, you know, I, I like a writer like say Tom McGuane from Montana who actually has a, is funny. His work is 
is funny in the way that I find it to be funny. And it's a relief for me because it's so at odds with a certain kind of male Western stance, you know, which is the lone sorrowing male, <laughs> basically. And there is not a shred of humor. And so, um, so I guess I, I respond to people that leaven their concerns and their work with with humor. And um, I also think it's a real bond and a real release um, often. There are the old women, I think it's in Rima, who go, he, he, he. <laughs> and they're kind of, they're this sort of chorus. And I know Maris, we're probably going, there is a question from Ingrid, um, but I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Dee. This has been, we're, we're in, not in a hurry, <laughs> um, um, but Ingrid does ask, I was wondering what's the most important thing for you when building characters? Is it their past, their motivations, or a mix of everything? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it might be the degree to which they contain it seems to be the case that they contain contradictions. Uh, characters that I remember in life and on the page generally have parts of themselves working against other parts of themselves, you know, so there's, there's conflict. And I'm just interested in, so I, I'm on the lookout when I'm, when I'm trying to think about characters um, for maybe memories of, of, of actual people I know that seem to particularly display that kind of contradiction. Um, or, or I, and or I, I keep it in mind as I'm trying to develop a character during the course of writing a book. I just, I think it is just interesting the way most of us work against ourselves in lots of ways. Um, you know, I mean, not, not actively or even maybe consciously sometimes, but maybe just contain traits that, that aren't perfectly compatible. We contain multitudes. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I like to think about that. And I guess that's what I try to do when I'm developing a character. Sometimes that process is helped by knowing, you know, or speculating about their their background too. But sometimes it could, I'm content to just have it be there. I see Jolene Brink. Well, yes, uh, Jolene says, how much of Missoula is hiding in the background of this book? And do you feel like the city changed on you while writing it? And if so, do you think about how that might change future novels inspired by the place where you've lived and worked for many years? Oh my, let's, oh, Jolene's lived there too. So let's see. Um, well, in, in aviary, it's Missoula. Um, and in fact, I, I make kind of merciless fun of some certain aspects of Missoula, <laughs> but I love Missoula, but it's easy to make fun of too, um, certain aspects of it. But um, yeah, it, you know, it is, it is changing and it's changing in the way that the larger country is. I mean, it, it reflects changes in the larger country, I think, which is, it is impossible to find reasonable housing in Missoula now, if you want to rent. I mean, just the whole housing crisis is just, when I came to Missoula, you could rent an apartment for $150, you know, and um, it's just not happening. Uh, anymore. And so the, and I think that possibly as a result of the pandemic and other factors, there are the people who have the money um, are, are moving into parts of the country that feel, you know, pretty and kind of, you can have a sort of salubrious life and at a college. And, um, and so the presence of the very, very rich um, isn't huge here yet, but it, it feels like it could be uh, become that. And um, Bozeman, for example, is far more full of the ultra rich at this point. But, um, 
Yeah, it's it's just part of the country, and it's um, it's not quite the little enclave that that it used to feel like. Bozeman is the Gold Coast. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Big money, the Gold Coast. <laughs> Well, Dee and Betsy, thank you so much for a really lovely and wonderful con conversation. And thanks to all of you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. How thank you. Dee. Talk to you soon. PC, Paula, Jerry, thanks. Jolene, bye.